Hello and welcome to Design Chat number 19. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming. Design Chat is the best weekly design discussion on the internet. Uh, tonight we are honored to have Mr. Paul Jenkins, uh, comic, book, comic book writer and creative director uh, on his own adventures. Um, so welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Hey Ryan, it's a pleasure to be here. Hi everyone, how you doing? Hi everybody in the chat room. Um, so, you know, today was sort of a short notice kind of thing. It was very cool uh, for you to take the time to come, come talk to us. Uh, I know you got a lot of projects going on. Um, I, just, uh, I just read the other day that uh, you're spending some more time at Marvel right now. Yeah, I took on a few new projects. I just finished, a, a completed a couple of projects for them. Uh, most notably, uh, some Captain America material that has uh, become really quite popular. We're getting a little bit of uh, press on it right now. Um, but I took on a couple of new new projects uh, that I can talk about a little bit here. Would it be um, this material right here? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That would be one of them, yeah. So, so the interesting side story to that is almost a year ago uh, to the date, um, uh, you spoke at CUSP Conference 08. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, and you met somebody there. Um, why don't you tell us about that experience and who you met? Well, I, I'm always the last minute guy, I guess, because Cusp uh, called me perhaps uh, six or seven days before the conference and asked me if I'd be willing to participate. And uh, for anybody that doesn't know, Cusp is an amazing experience. Uh, it's, it's really, they get a lot of uh, forward thinking people in together and you get to hear some amazing people talk about some amazing concepts. Um, here's a link coming up here right now. Um, and so I flew in at the last moment. I actually knew very closely uh, one of the people who was uh, at CUSP, who's Kirsty Hawkshire, a musician. And um, I flew in, got to meet the guys, and literally it was uh, September the 11th, uh, which was a strange kind of situation for me because the first guy who I've become very friendly with is a guy called Lyle Awoko, who's an amazing photographer who took uh, one of the most important pictures or, or, or a, a, a photograph that's described as one of the ten most important photos of all time, which is the picture of the plane hitting the, uh, the Twin Towers. Um, and, it, and remember again, this was September the 11th that the co conference began. And um, then the second person on stage was a guy called Brian Anderson, who is a triple amputee who survived his horrific injuries and has become a real uh, amazing kind of uh, role model for a lot of people. Um, so Brian walks on stage again on September 11th with his fake legs and you know obviously lots of people were crying and Brian gave an amazing speech about how he's become a stuntman and an actor and how this has become an opportunity for him. And then I was the third person on, and I had to kind of walk on and say, well, I, you know, I do comics and video games. <laughs> I'm not really sure what to say. Um, but it was, it was a brilliant situation, and I became very, very friendly with Brian Anderson. Um, he and I have become good friends. He's actually visited me in Atlanta. And, and at the time, I met two people that I was very intrigued with, and Brian was one of them. And I really wanted to put his story into uh, the public eye in Captain America, and Captain America has become very popular over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, for anybody that knows out there, he actually was, he died over the course of the last year, and there was a big publicity push about it. Um, so I got to write Captain America Theater of War, which is really a concept that takes Captain America and moves him all the way through American military history, and this story was set in Iraq in, in the first Gulf War, and it really told the story of Brian Anderson, and it's set against his experiences in the military and his experiences with his commanding officer. Um, so it was a tremendous privilege to meet Brian, but the, the, the catalyst for it was um, Brian said one of the most honest things I've ever heard when he when I talked to him about what happened with um, with uh, his experience, um, Brian told me that it wasn't. It was a positive thing, and that he felt sorry for the guy who was in his turret in his Humvee. Um, Kenny, I remembered Kenny's name, and Kenny came back to Chicago or wherever it is he lives, and he got a job in construction, and he was about to lose his job. So whereas Brian had been given an opportunity to become a wheelchair spokesman, throw out the first pitch at the Cubs, become a Grand Marshal of the Kentucky firework display. 
Kenny had come back to a job, everyone kind of forgot about him, and he was in danger of losing his job. And if that happened, then Kenny was going to end up going back to Iraq. And, and so Brian genuinely said, I feel sorry for him. To hear a guy who's a triple amputee say he feels sorry for his able-bodied friend is quite a powerful experience. So as your friendship came closer, you were able to um, sort of work out this deal where you were to include him on this most recent issue. Tells his story. Let's get a little closer. Running with the uh, running with the soldiers there, um, and so this this just came out recently, right? How recent was that? Uh, came out about two weeks ago, and the thing that I was uh, most gratified with was that um, Brian called me immediately. He found a copy of it. Uh, the funny thing about it is that I actually it takes me a while to get my copies. <laughs> I don't have a copy of the book yet. If anybody actually, yet. <laughs> no, if anybody wants to send me one, it'd be really nice because Marvel take forever. <laughs> but um, basically, uh, Brian called me, and he just was extremely. Um, he's extremely complimentary, and he just said, "You nailed it." You know, he he thought it was perfect. That might be a buddy of mine, Mike Delicio. If that's you, how's it going, bud? I see Mike out there, probably. <laughs> There he is. There it there is. There he is. It is, it is Mike. Um, so you know, obviously, the, the the terrifying thing when you write detective fiction is to have a friend of yours who works on the police force or as a detective read it and make sure that you got it right. And uh, Brian read it and said that you know, the marriage of his real life experience with my interpretation using Captain America. Because the, frankly, I can't write a story that's even someone as interesting as Brian and have comic fans read it. They're not interested. But they are interested in reading Captain America. And so I can put his story into Captain America and kind of integrate it. And that's what we did. And it's uh, proven to be quite a success. We're beginning to get a little bit of uh, press on it. And I think that we're beginning to get a little bit of play on it. Um, and you know, I've had a couple of inquiries about it now. So I'm, I'm very excited that Brian's story will also go out. And one last thing I should say is that USA Cares, which is you know a, a tremendous organization um, that helps deal with uh, post 9/11 um, veterans and the problems that they face, um, are interested in, in in giving a lot of those comics out, doing a bike ride across the country, and actually handing those comics out as material. So I'm tremendously honored because I have a close attachment to the military. That's amazing. Do, uh, do you have any information about when that's going to happen? It literally, it literally came up, um, you know, in the last week. Brian called me and said they would like to do it, so I, I'm obviously excited for that to happen. Um, I hope we hear about more about that in the future, and definitely pass mm -hmm. anything you have on to me, and I'll spread the word. Yeah. So, uh, for everybody who's here who maybe hasn't been part of uh, Design Chat before. Uh, my name is Ryan McGovern. On Twitter, I'm Hoopajoob, H-U-P-A-J-O-O-B. And uh, watch in the chat room there. We've got Design Chat links. Is going to be sending uh, links out and, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, on Twitter, I'm Hoopajoob and uh, Design Chat. Also, I'm an art director from the Midwest. Uh, this is the 19th episode of uh, Design Chat, and I'm honored to be here tonight with Paul Jenkins. Which really cool about doing the show is that I get to meet really interesting people all the time and talk about what's going on. In, in the creative professional world. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to do another uh, 45 minutes, so 40 minutes of discussion. And near the end, uh, we'll do some uh, Q&A from the chat room with Paul. So again, uh, thank you again to Paul uh, for coming. And uh, just so everybody knows, uh, we are broadcasting from Samata Mason, uh, which we've been doing uh, very uh, uh, successfully for the last uh, handful of weeks. And uh, so a quick thank you to, uh, to them for letting us come. Um, and we talked already about CUSP Conference, which uh, you spoke at uh, last year in 08. And it's coming up again, September 16th and 17th, cuspconference.com. And uh, they talk about the design of everything. So it's really, it's a design conference, but it, it, it's got tangents on many other worlds. It's a very interesting event. If you haven't registered already, please go to cuspconference.com. Um, so, uh, okay, so... So just in case there are people here who aren't familiar with your very impressive body of work, um, throw, some, throw some projects out there. Talk about a brief history about um, things that you've done. 
Yeah, I've actually uh, been involved in quite a few relatively uh, interesting moments of um, comic book history. When I first came to America, um, I met a couple of guys who had a black and white comic book that they'd managed to sell as a co as a TV show and, a, and as a, a, a toy. And I lived in the small town of Northampton, Massachusetts, and so I got to be very um, friendly with these guys, and I got to be friendly with actually the wife of one of the fellas. Um, and at the time, you know, I was like playing in a band. Uh, I had been teaching music and drama to learning disabled children in Pennsylvania, and I came to Massachusetts, and um, that was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and that's where I started my career. I was the, actually the third employee of the Ninja Turtles, and um, I worked in this tiny office that was just, you know, that was literally like 12 feet by 12 feet, and um, I worked mostly in editorial and production at the time, um, but very, very quickly I ended up working in licensing because the thing was really taking off at the time. They'd already done some of the licensing, but this thing was just getting worldwide huge. So, next thing I know, you know, I'm 20 years or 21 years old and I'm on the phone with the CEO of Burger King <laughs> discussing like crazy million dollar deals and, um, and trying to help the licensing guy uh, who was in charge of basically maintaining our end of the licensing agreement. And it taught me everything I need to know about business and we really hit the ground running. Um, uh, I wasn't too, too fond of it, to be quite honest, um, because while the, the two creators of the Ninja Turtles, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, were very humble about what had happened to them, they always described themselves as being lucky, I found that um, a lot of the people surrounding Mirage, Mirage Studios, which was the home of the Ninja Turtles, uh, felt that the money and the prestige that came with it were you know, were like tickets for them to basically uh, walk into any room with a large ego and basically dazzle everybody. And I wasn't too fond of that because I'm a very realistic kind of person. So I went from there to a place called Tundra Publishing, which was uh, one of the two Ninja Turtles uh, creators, Kevin Eastman, created Tundra Publishing. And the concept was to bring uh, to the creative community an opportunity to make... Um, um, comics of their own that they could exploit. Um, now at the time Marvel and, and DC were just massive companies and they were selling collectible covers. That was really the way they, they were selling comics as collectibles because if you bought the first issue of Spider-Man for 12 cents it was now worth 190,000. So what they told the unsuspecting public was buy our dollar comic and it will be worth two million in five years. Well when you sell seven and a half million copies of a comic it's not going to be a collectible comic. And this was, it was like any bubble, right? It was going to burst. So I went to Tundra Publishing and we paved the way for, uh, by helping create the Creator's Bill of Rights. We paved the way to, um, um, for Image, which, uh, you know, anyone that's familiar with comics will know Todd McFarlane, who created Spawn. Uh, Mark Silvestri created a company called Top Cow that does Witchblade, which has been on TV, um, and The Darkness, which has been a video game which I actually wrote for uh, 2K Games, um, and a lot of other creators, that, and, and we were the people that gave them their inspiration. In fact, they came to us, apparently, and uh, unfortunately, Kevin Eastman uh, turned them down. <laughs> I don't know why. I think he made a bit of a mistake, but, you know. Um, so, I went from there. Uh, to become an editor-in-chief and I got very, very tired uh, of, of a company in Cincinnati and I got very, very tired of watching people hand in substandard work with no thought to the creation of it, I felt. And um, so I decided I was going to be a freelance writer and um, I broke into comics as a writer the only way that it is absolutely impossible to do. I flew, flew myself, I had thousands and thousands of dollars of credit card debt because I had stayed uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, to be the editor-in-chief of this company. Um, and unfortunately, they had ripped off a lot of creators, and so I had to live there and try to get these people paid, and the company filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And in fact, they had the license to make uh, NFL trading cards, uh, the collectible editions, and uh, they were run by a Pentecostal church. I've got nothing against Pentecostal church, I really don't, but these people were, were the only crooked people I've ever really run into in my life. And they... T it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was horrific. They basically disappeared off to um, wherever they went in the middle of the night. They took all the machinery with them. And it really, really affected my life because they owed me a lot of money. But they also left cookbooks of, in which it, I, they told the government that I'd been paid where I hadn't been paid. So I had to pay taxes on money I hadn't uh, uh, collected. 
So I looped off a credit card trying to get these creators paid and I, I never got them paid. Um, anyway, cut long story short, I went down to San Diego convention with no money and I met the editor of a book called Hellblazer, which is the book that um, was the inspiration for the movie Constantine, or Constantine, depending on what you call it. Um, and I asked him, I hear you're looking for a new writer, is there any chance that I could try out? And he said, what have you written? I said, I've never written anything in my life. And he gave me an opportunity and um, I sent in my first script and they called me up after a little while and said, congratulations, you're the new writer of Hellblazer. What was it that made you, what, what was it that made you aim for that specific uh, magazine? Uh, we'll tell you you're dropping out a little bit, by the way. Ryan. I was asking, uh, what was it made, that made you aim for that specific book? And, oh, okay. And uh, when did you know that you wanted to write? I knew I wanted to write because I kept reading. I was an editor of a lot of comics, right? I, I used to see them all the time. And I knew I wanted to write because I had been Neil Gaiman's editor. Um, I was Alan Moore's editor at Tundra. Uh, one thing that people don't realize about me is I actually was in editorial for maybe six or seven years before I became a freelance writer. Um, I was the original series editor on Alan Moore's Big Numbers, which is actually an amazing piece of comic history in itself. Um, I actually brought, look, I brought uh, so some people could see this. Anyone that knows anything about comics is about to see something uh, that's never been seen before. This thing here is a page. Let's see if I can get it for you. That is a page of Big Numbers number three. I actually own half of the book. Um, it was never published, um, and people have been waiting to see that for however many years. He actually, Alan created a 12-issue breakdown for a series that was about fractal mathematics. Um, it's an amazing piece of work, right? But I was originally his editor on From Hell. I was originally his editor on um, on Big Numbers. Um, I was the original series editor. I had Cages. I was Violent Cases with Neil Gaiman. And so I knew so much about what good writers could do. And he used to get these massive scripts that Alan Moore used to send me. And as his editor, it's not like I was going to tell him, hey, man, I've seen something that I think you should change. But what was really cool about Alan was that a couple of times I did ask him a couple of questions. And he one time he even said, well, nice, nice catch, Paul. OK, we'll change it. So he's very humble. Well, as an editor, I got to see a lot of people's material, and I thought it was really not so great. And I realized that I could do it. Uh, and if I was going to do it, I was going to do it to the best of my ability, and I've had quite a lot of success ever since. But as the Hellblazer, um, I think it just fit me. I was very lucky to have found a title about a working-class British magician, and I happened to have a British accent, so I could really kind of propose to them that I knew what I was going to write about, you know. <laughs> that comes in handy. Yeah. And, and I wrote a version that was very strange because I actually grew up in the countryside and they had always written Constantine, John Constantine's character as a guy who was a Londoner and he was always drinking and carousing. But I grew up uh, in the country in real magic. I grew up near fairy rings, you know, burial man of an English king. Um, I lived on a Roman road that was, you know, 2,000 years old. Um, we used to find Roman artifacts outside my house, literally just walk up the street and find them, lots of glass bottles and uh, occasionally a coin, I think a couple of them. Um, so in my case, um, you know, I had a tremendous affinity for the country. And I lived in the same county as Stonehenge. I used to go there all the time. And we had lots and lots of fairy rings and, and ley lines and stuff. And so I just wrote about that instead. I thought it was really interesting for, for the readers. And I can... I can uh, speak to that also. I've been to England um, three times in the last four years, and every time I come back, I tell people um, it's no wonder that this is where fairy tales came from. You spend a little bit of time there, and there is a magic to the land. Um, I didn't get to see Stonehenge, but uh, a, a stone circle much like that, uh, Long Meg and her sisters, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we got to it, and it was me and my wife, and, and we, it was one of those things where we saw it on a map, we decided to go there that day, and we were the only people there. And then the sun was setting, and we happened to be there at the right time of year where the sun was aligned with the stones, and it was coming right down in between two of them. And it's, you know, yeah. it's a very powerful sort of magic moment when you realize you're on this piece of land that has so much more history than you'll ever know. And yeah, uh, and yeah it can have a profound effect on somebody. So I wrote about it in the terms of um, how my 
the, the, the kings of and queens of England are not the kings and queens of England. They're Greek. They're German, for God's sake. You know, none of them like they're all descended from other countries. Whereas your average man who lives in the countryside, and one of the characters that was John Constantine's buddy, ends up being the descendant of King Arthur, because Arthur was there, and and Perida and all the Welsh legends are in the Mabinogi. And my family are Welsh by descent. I'm Welsh by descent. Sorry, and. My family, uh, you know, we are very close to the Welsh uh, valleys, the Black Mountains. My mum lived there, and uh, a particular town called Dolgethly, and there's a Welsh mining village called Monith Dressel, and that uh, we were all from. When we did our genealogy, on my father's side, it was the same Richard Jenkins was the firstborn and lived in the same mining village for almost 900 years. Um, so that it was easy to do our genealogy because on my mum's side they were from everywhere and on my dad's side they just all died of, like they were all coal miners and they died of, died of black lung uh, really young but you know we were all from Wales so we had this great affinity for the country you know and I wrote about that and I, I think it was interesting because I'm not sure the fans really dug it maybe they did maybe they didn't I actually have ended up writing more issues of Hellblazer than anyone that ever wrote the title so maybe but professionals really liked my take, and I used to get a lot of uh, compliments from fellow pro uh, professionals. So, you know, uh, it, it's a tough one. It's like they never reprinted my run, for instance, which I find very strange. You know, DC never did. Maybe they'll get round to it. I've asked him a couple of times, but I'm not sure if it was just not that well received. Who knows? You know? Is that something you do a lot? Is is study history before you? Um, once again, by the way, you're dropping out. I, I wish I could hear that. You might have oh, to speak sorry, up. Sorry, I was asking you. if um, is that something you do a no. lot? Uh, that you stu you'll study history before you, uh, you know, you'll do some research and look up things that actually happened to inspire mm -hmm. the stories that you tell. Yeah, I am uh, a research fiend. I have a weird place in comics as a writer because um, the one thing I don't know anything about is comics. Um, it's just really strange. I. I I know about them because I write them, and I do get all of Marvel's issues every month, so I'm interested in uh, what it is that's being written. I think they're really cool. You know, I love comics, right? But I don't have enough time to read all of them. Um, so a lot of the other writers that I meet, a lot of my friends that do it, they know everything about every appearance of Deathlock, the robot guy or something, and I just don't, right? What I, what I am interested in is people, and I'm interested in research, and so... Um, for a while I did uh, this book that obviously people know the Wolverine origin because the movie just came out a couple of months ago and um, when origin was done I ended up spending something like three hours on the phone with the Canadian Historical Railway Association because I was trying to find, I'd written a scene where he, he goes on a, on a railway in 1890 from Alberta, Canada to British Columbia. And I said, I can't write that scene unless I know that he could have done such a thing. And so we planned out this map and we worked out that it really could have happened and that's what I did, you know. It's, uh, I'm, I'm the research guy and I love to get things correct. So I, I love detective fiction. Um, it's, it's kind of something that I do. And the other thing that I'm probably known for is that I, I do like to just do single issues and two issue stories about character stuff. So. When I did Spider-Man, I did, did that for about five years, and a lot of mine were single issues. And I would tackle issues like euthanasia and just really crazy stuff that no one else is going to do in Spider-Man, you know. And that's one of the cool things. If you get one, one of those character issues and, and uh, really get into that story and you get those histor historical perspectives, you're going to touch on things that, you know, it's going to wake up. Uh, something in the reader, you know, and, and I think that's what makes the stories that much more special. Um, before the chat, you had sent me a, a whole bunch of links uh, or images, rather, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, scrolling through them behind me uh, to kind of keep the conversation going here. Um, yeah. And they're in absolutely no uh, order. I think they're in alphabetical order. Uh, this is the guy that uh, we were talking about earlier, Brian. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his last name right now. Henderson. Um, and uh, yeah. is this at the conference last year? I'm thinking it's probably at the conference uh, because I look as though I have, I'm about to have a really bad hangover the next day, so my guess would be <laughs> it was one of the nights that we went out. But yeah, that's, uh, that's Brian and I. Uh, we, this is when we had just met. Um, we were very friendly and, uh, uh, you know, we were just kind of hanging out a little bit at the show. This is Brian. The picture that I see up there is Brian coming onto the CUSP conference stage. Um, and... Brian walked on, like I said, it was, it was September the 11th, so it was quite a powerful moment. 
but Brian actually walked on and he has these uh, two amazing legs that were made I believe in Germany and uh, they're like electronic legs but he doesn't use them so much because he can get himself around a lot better in his wheelchair than he can get around on those legs but should he choose to walk around and actually you know want to be uh, eye level with somebody he can get onto those legs you know I think these are stills from the, the, the most recent Captain uh, America uh, yeah. theater of war uh, that we were talking about. So when, when, we're, looking at, when we're looking at artwork um, in your story, uh, it, something I was always curious, curious about is when, when you write a story like this and, and you're working with the illustrator who's going to actually produce the imagery, what, what sort of conversations do you have about, okay, well, there should be like a moment of a reflection where you're looking at this image and processing what this story is. How do the, some of those conversations go? You know, it's an interesting thing because I, I do a couple of things again that I think uh, perhaps a, a number of other writers don't do as much as I do. Uh, the first thing I do is that I, I love to con converse with the artist. Uh, one of the things I'll do is I'll actually say to them, look, you know, um, here's my story, this is what I'm going to write about, but I'd love to get your thoughts. What do you like to draw? Which part of this interests you? Do you have any ideas? And, and artists will often have amazing ideas. Because remember that comic artists are very much storytellers, much more so than... than I mean, I, I mean that's, not, that's not fair to you know, an average painter or something like that, but I'm, I'm just saying that you know, their job is to do storyboards in a sense, frozen moments in time. So they have great storytelling ideas, great storytelling and sensibilities. And um, this particular one was a little different because I actually collaborated on the story with Brian himself not so much with the artist because I had to tell the artist kind of this is exactly what's going on this is really Brian's life and the picture that you've got up there behind you um, really was actually an anecdote and many of them were anecdotes that Brian had told me uh, this particular one is when Brian first got to Baghdad airport and they had come across the desert um, and somebody shot at him it was the first time he'd ever been shot at and the bullets pinged off of his window he said and his reaction was that he got really annoyed and so he opened the window and started just firing out the window because he was really annoyed that anybody would dare to try and shoot at him, <laughs> uh, which I think is really funny, right? So good on, good on Brian, right? And so I wrote it. I just thought it was... It, the funny thing about that story is that there are some really f interesting moments uh, with Brian, um, funny things that happened. Uh, there's another scene in the book uh, that I don't think you have the art for um, where... Brian told me that the first time they had an air raid, the air raid sirens went off and nobody really knew what to do. They'd all been trained to put their gas masks on, but they just, they put them on backwards, they dropped them, they lost them. <laughs> it's really funny. And um, uh, so by the time the commanding officer actually came into the thing, uh, you know, everybody had their gas masks on backwards. This picture here is another one that, uh, believe it or not, even though it's obviously a powerful moment, this is the moment that Brian himself actually got blown up in his Humvee. Um, I, I talked to Brian and I said, which page do you want? Because uh, um, I've asked the artist if he wouldn't mind giving you a copy of the page. So Brian says he wants the one where he gets blown up. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is actually really f funny, yeah, you know. It's great. It's amazing to have that moment yeah. in his life that's it, it's absolutely yeah. changed everything he's he's going to do from that point, you know, and, and definitely in a positive direction. To have it reflected in the comic book, I'm sure, is a very moving thing for him. Chuck yeah. was, was uh, just grabbing the the the, uh, the book here and showing the the scene that you were just talking about when the air air raid went off and they, they're panicking yeah. and they don't know what to do there. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting one because uh, there were some little touches. You know, this is fiction, right? So of course I have to add some things that tie the story together. It can't just be the story of Brian's life. It has to be an, a decent retelling of Brian's life. And I told this to Brian when I first started doing the story. But I have to take some creative license um, because if I don't take creative license, as as powerful and interesting as Brian's story is it will fall to pieces as a comic. So I have to be able to tell it as a comic. It's a little bit like getting a film and doing a film ad adaptation of somebody's life. If you don't take some creative license, I think that you'll, uh, you'll probably fall into some difficulties, you know? Um, so I, I, I actually, it's funny that it's kind of an affection for the page where Brian gets blown up. But I will tell you this, that it was a very difficult page to write because I know Brian and, and I, I, the feeling of 
writing a page in which I describe a guy that I know in the third person and say, look, he gets blown up to the artist is a strange thing to write. It's, it's not something that you come across every day, you know? Would you say that this is the most difficult challenge that you've had as a writer? That's a great question, but no, I don't think so. I mean, I think in, in some ways it was actually very liberating. It was, it was a unique challenge, that's what I'll say, because I've never written about somebody that I know, uh, their, their whole life story. Um, I've, I've not had to do things where I fictionalized somebody's account of what it was that they did. I have written about all kinds of people that I know and things that I've seen and situations. Um, as a strange story, I mean, I think perhaps the most difficult stories I've written, I, I remember in Wolverine Origin I had to write a, a bit about a dog getting its throat cut, and I'm a huge animal lover, right? So I, I couldn't write the page, I just, I couldn't, I kept, kept telling the artist, like, I, I don't want to write the bit where the, the dog gets its throat cut, can you just do it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got a couple other images here that I'm going to move on to. Uh, one I recognized earlier today, I was looking for you, um, for if you had a Twitter account, uh, which we'll post up in the in the room in just a second. Yeah. Um, but it was this image that I recognized. It's uh, from earlier as your icon. And, yeah. And right away, it was an image that drew me in. And I was looking at this icon. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's it's possible. That, you know, this could have something to do with him, but I'm not totally sure. But then you sent sent it to me earlier. And yeah. it's, it's one, I think it's one of those that's going to stick in my head for a while. Can you tell us the story behind this? Well, uh, I can tell you the story behind this. In fact, it even ties into the thing that we were talking about, about uh, the story with Brian. Okay, um, This is a picture, and I'm not sure if people can see it clearly, but it's basically a picture of me versus the Internet. And the reason is that fans are cool. <laughs> fans are really cool, right? I love the fans. They pay my wages, and I love to meet... Um, the fans at conventions, uh, it's an interesting and strange kind of situation to be in because people come out, they're very, very complimentary, uh, they love your work. But the fans of the internet, uh, the people that basically write into message boards, fan is truly short for fanatic and some of the guys get really, really bent out of shape um, because I've written something that's contradicted their feeling of what should have happened. Uh, pe I've lost count of the amount of times that people say, well, Spider-Man would never do that. And my answer is, look, Spider-Man would because he just did. I mean, I wrote that and that's what Spider-Man did. He would do that. If I, I, my, my favorite thing to say at conventions is that once a fan asked me my opinion on Spider-Man's favorite flavor of pizza, and I said, I, I don't know, and they got really upset that I did not know or I didn't have an opinion. So eventually I said, well, you know, um, I think his favorite flavor of pizza then is pepperoni. And the fan got so annoyed with me because he says in an issue 10 years ago that he doesn't like pepperoni pizza. And I should have known that. The fan got so annoyed, right? So here's something that just happened to me with, with Brian's story. I happened to be online and um, I'm beginning to do a new uh, series of uh, online posts. I used to do a thing for newsarama.com, it was called Flogging a Dead Horse, and it was a, <laughs> it was a fan, it was just basically me writing about my stupid life, like five, five crazy people I dated and my ten most stupid sports injuries and just nothing to do with comics, right? And I happened acro across a fan's comment on my story about Brian Anderson. The fan took issue with the fact that I wrote how long it took uh, Brian and his guys to drive from the border at Kuwait all the way to Baghdad and said it couldn't be that way. No way could it be that way. Um, it would take you much longer to drive. Oh, no, sorry, it wouldn't take you as long to drive directly from Kuwait to the border. And I'm like, look, man, you know, Brian was there. He's the guy who told me how long it took. How could you, uh, how could you get upset with me and argue with me that I was wrong in my research and I clearly don't know what kind of story I'm talking about. And that, that's my thing about me versus the internet. I, uh, I, I truly adore like doing what I do for a living. I love the fans, but sometimes that kind of thing gets me down because uh, you know I'm being criticized for stuff that I don't even, I don't even, there's no defense against it, right? The well, guy criticized, I was gonna say the guy criticized, <laughs> the guy criticizing me is Love Monkey number 69, right? I'm Paul Jenkins, so they can say whatever they want, and I have to maintain kind of professional, respectful decorum, you know? What do you think it is about uh, comic books um, that, that people take them to heart? You know, you know, 
it's 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 an entertainment form, you know. Uh, it's is it be, do you think it's because of the characters that they feel they've they've built a relationship with those characters and they also know them so well um, that they 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 sort of make it parts of their lives because it doesn't really seem like with other forms of entertainment that people get so personal about it. <laughs> she loved monkey number nine has just posted. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> But, um, um, I think it's two things. A lot of fans um, feel as though I'm one of their best friends. I know that that has been something that's happened to me a lot. You know, uh, fans see my work. If I'm working a lot in comics, they'll see my work every month. They'll read three or four stories, so they know me. They because you know they get to see what I think about the world. Um, but I'll also say that they feel a tremendous ownership of the characters and, and every the dynamic has changed in the last 10 years because of the internet they're very very close to the creators now they get to be able to talk to us directly and so you get the best and the worst of that it's nice for them to be able to uh, in fact I have no problem with people criticizing my work saying I didn't really get it I didn't like it, it wasn't my favorite book I, I I'm also though in the firing line like any other creator if you're online and connected to the fans some of them would love to do the job that I do and so because of that they will try to get a reaction from me because at that point it makes them feel as though they, ha <clears throat> they have something to do with a the character. They don't, but they feel like they do. You know, it's a complicated dynamic that I'm only just understanding. <laughs> um, so, do you think there will be a time where the conversation uh, with your fans will carry over into the storytelling? Mm, with me, probably not. And the reason is because I do write for the fans. I write about myself for the fans. Or I write about the things that I see or know, and I write it for the fans. But in that uh, relationship that you described, that means I'm writing about the fans and the things that they want. That just is never going to work. It's a recipe for disaster. And it could get confusing. Uh, uh, com comics are confusing enough. You know? Right, yeah. Let's keep that part out of it. Um, yeah. Let me back out of this one real quick. There were some other really cool ones that you were sending along. Okay, Spider-Man with Conan O'Brien. <laughs> I got to know the story behind this. This is some amazing amazing uh, imagery, but there's nothing in the chat bubbles. No, it's, uh, it's from a book I did called Mythos, and Mythos was basically they asked me to take, um, they asked me to take uh, the five or six of the, the original characters that have been portrayed in movies and find a way to take the original, usually a Stan Lee origin, um, and mix it with the movie version so that people could get an accessible origin of the comics. And within that job I had to create my own voice for it too. So one of the original scenes in Spider-Man is that he goes on TV and he goes in some variety show and he begins to be the webbed wonder Spider-Man so that he can earn some money. In our version we did it on the Conan O'Brien show and it's stupid human tricks. Right, right. Oh, that's perfect. That's a perfect fit. <laughs> this one, I think that's yeah. the last one. Of that. As the, yeah, that one there, there that you see is a page of a book called The Sentry, which was uh, a character that I created for... Um, uh, for Marvel, it's something that I'm very proud of because, you know, there have not been so many cam characters created for Marvel in the last, say, 25 years that have really sustained. I, you know, uh, you can look at Venom, the, the, the Spider-Man character, and you can look at the Sentry and a couple of others, and they really haven't lasted. You know, they kind of come and they go. And the Sentry is a ma Marvel mainstay now. He's a main character in Marvel, and he's part of the Avengers, and he's in the books all the time. So I'm really excited to have created that character because he will be a legacy of mine for my kids. For, you know, for many years to come. It seems like we're in sort of like a like a renaissance period right now, where, where all these comic book heroes are making their way to the silver screen and, mm -hmm. and getting much more exposure uh, to these characters that that you know otherwise wouldn't have had this exposure, except for just the, you know the comic book world. Um, is is that is that an interaction that you're enjoying in this period? You know, because because you've been part of this world. You know, you're back, we were talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, and that's, you know, they sort of started that. You know, they had their movie, um, and then there was sort of a dead time. But now it's like every other movie that comes out has to do with one of these characters. Is this a period that you're liking, or is it, or is it, um, do you think it's affecting the comic book world in a negative way? Um, 
I think it's probably affecting the comic book world actually in, in a strange and negative way. Um, it, it's a weird dynamic because much of what I know the main writers on the on the main ongoing series have to deal with is the requests that come in from Marvel West. So they're trying to find a way to, to ride the line um, to reflect what's happening in the films. And that makes a lot of business sense. But I don't know if it makes as much sense to the fans of comics. You know, they, they would love to be able to keep their characters uh, intact within the comic world. So it's very, very difficult, I think, for your average com so, you know, people that are really interested and used to working with comics. It becomes really tough because you don't know, wait a minute, all of my characters are suddenly being rewritten or they're being written in weird ways that, that, that I don't recognize. Now, here's, here's my lucky part of this. I get to write single issue stories all the time and I, I now have a new series basically where I'm able to actually come into the Marvel Universe and find a set of characters. Um, I just did it with Captain America because not only did I do the story about Brian Anderson, I was also able to do stories about uh, Captain America and an experience he has with a very terrified soldier in the Second World War. Uh, an experience that, that uh, a good friend of mine is is um, a guy, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Dare, who uh, wrote a lot of the handbook on um, on the rules of engagement for the American Army. Um, he's actually really miffed and mystified by the fact that after the Second World War, the United States executed nine Japanese soldiers for the crime of waterboarding, and yet 50 years later, or 60 years later, we feel we can go do it ourselves. Doesn't make sense, right? I got to write all of those cool things, and now I'm gonna now I finish saying what I had to say with Captain America. My last Captain America issue will come out, and then I'm gonna go on to the world of Thor and the Asgardians. <laughs> uh, Thor is kind of cool; he's a Norse god, right, or a, uh, you know a, some kind of pagan god. And so I get to talk a little bit about people's beliefs, religion, existential matters, things that you know we have a, a crisis of self, a crisis of faith. I get to write that against the backdrop of Thor and the other characters. And then I might move into Spider-Man. Then I might move to... I mean, I've got some plan for the X-Men. So while it's tougher for the average fan to connect because the, the, the monthly titles are having a hard time connecting, it's easier for me because I get to do single-issue stories that really fit my style. And I can just say the essence of the character and then move on, you know? I'm going to move on to Deadpool. <laughs> someone just, Very someone just asked me that. <laughs> um, so you were saying earlier, uh, before we started the chat, that uh, that you're working on a movie right now that you can talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Which movie is that, and where in the process are you? Um, I, I'm in the typical uh, Hollywood uh, process of being in a holding pattern. Um, I'm actually slated to co-direct a movie called Tattoo, which is uh, a movie about... Um, a guy who has tattoos all over his body that he can that come alive, and he finds out um, that somebody killed his wife and his child, and so he tattoos weapons all over himself and goes after after the people that did it. The cool thing about that movie, even though on the face obviously it's an action movie, is that revenge missions are really interesting to me because you can't win a revenge mission you've already lost because you lost more the thing that you need revenge for is bigger than the, 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 the you, is, is a bigger loss than the gain you make by having revenge but in, in this particular movie he actually finds a way to actually have his revenge and be paid back uh, it's like the first story I can think of where someone actually wins a revenge movie um, I also have a couple of interesting projects um, that I'm about to announce. I own a company uh, uh, called Clockstop, and Clockstop Entertainment. We're basically an IP management company, but we create a lot of our own material, and we actually have three or four um, deals either signed or in the works, um, including optioning something for television. Uh, we have uh, a deal with uh, one of the biggest uh, studios in the history of the entertainment business and I actually have a deal pending with a very famous producer director now I can't talk about it because it's it's I was just too early say, to we're talk not about find out what that is are we you you're not gonna find out here because all you do is you preempt the, the process itself it takes such a long time to to get those things to actually happen that you basically you leak out that material and it's just too early and things go kind of sideways so what's happening with tattoo though 
you know, we've advertised that we're doing it, we're promoting it. Uh, the um, producer, this guy called Rick Schwartz, who was on Gangs of New York and The Departed, and um, we're waiting for Rick to kind of organize his time a little bit right now. We're waiting for that, that other stuff. So, um, you know, making a big film is a very long process, and there's nothing that we can do about it as directors. We have to kind of sit there and wait for them to give us a production schedule, but the script is written, and, uh, you know, we're, we're basically chomping at the bit to get going. In the meantime, I have a couple of other projects. I've got uh, some animation projects that we're doing. I just completed a thing called uh, Cyber Racers, which <laughs> is kind of fun because I repurposed something that was going a bit sideways, and we got to, uh, I got to go in as a voice director, um, I was nominated for a BAFTA award of, for a video game that I actually announced at, um, at the CUSP conference last year, um, um, which is called The Darkness, which is a comic that I wrote. So I work a lot in video games now, a lot of television stuff, a lot of comics. I do a lot of everything, basically. Something I've always been curious about is you hear stories about the Hollywood process and how drawn out it can be and, and when projects get put on hold for a long time, how does it affect you as a, you know, a creative professional? Because the creative process, you know, for some people has to be very specific, you know, and it has to happen within a certain amount of time, or right when, a, <clears throat> right when an idea comes to someone. So how do those two, you know, Hollywood process and video game making process, how, how do those influence your creative process, or do they? Well, I'll tell you this, the, the lucky part for me, is that uh, it's very difficult to assess yourself to say what you really are talented at and you believe you are talented at. It's very difficult to even define what talent is as opposed to say preparation and hard work. I know that I'm very prepared, I know that I work very hard, but it's hard to describe yourself as being talented or, or it's very difficult to say that kind of thing. I can tell you what my two talents are though, maybe three. I'm a really good pool player and I guarantee you can't beat me. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really good, <laughs> I'm really good when I play golf uh, when someone hits a putt, doesn't matter how far away it is from the hole, the moment they hit it, if I know it's, I can say that's going in, and it will go in, right? That's my second talent. The third talent I have as a writer, that's not luck, it's just talent. <laughs> um, but the, the third uh, talent that I have, and it's a writing talent, is that I, I have the ability to immediately throw myself into the world that I'm about to work on. So the way I've always described it is that I, you could take me on a roller coaster, ride me up and down for five minutes, stick me at the, just stop the roller coaster in the middle, hand me a piece of paper and say I need two pages about cabbage, and I need them to be good, and I could probably do it. It, it just it happens to be a talent of mine. I can immediately jump into a project. So for me, perhaps it's a little bit different from other people. I, I'm a, I'm able to, um, I'm able to go in to a project like Tattoo and immediately get back to work. Um, but I think it is harder for some other people. I can see why. The Hollywood process itself is just mutonic. It's just awful. And if it wasn't for the fact I was able to make uh, larger projects for a larger audience, I, I wouldn't uh, have that much to do with it. I specifically stayed away for a long time. Remember, I was exposed to it very early in my career because we made the Ninja Turtle films and I had got to see it. And, I got to create a couple of things with Kevin Eastman that we took into uh, Los Angeles and basically ran into the system. Obviously, I'm older and wiser now, and I know how to do it, um, but I don't do it by myself anymore. I have a company. You know, we have a CEO, and you know, we have the structure internally. We have the people that we work with. Um, we have people on the west, the, the west Coast. We have people on the East Coast. And we've made a business of it as opposed to me being a freelancer. If I was a freelancer, I would direct Tatua, and then I would hope I could get another job. Now, with my company, Clockstop, I'm able to basically parlay what I already have into future work anyway. And we're doing very well with it. Very good to hear. <laughs> I, I see someone asking me about the Wizard World of Doom story, uh, which I will, I'll, I'll tell that in a second, all right? Yeah, we'll get to it. <laughs> well, actually, we're getting to the, the time of the night where we need to transition into the Q&A. Uh, okay. We do have a handful of people here that I think have... Uh, Diane asked some questions. I know Sean was saying everybody in the chat room go ahead and start shooting them up and uh, hopefully they don't, they don't go too fast and we can address them as they, as they move up. All right, I'll, st I'll, start with the, I'll start with the Wheel of Death story, okay? Because, you know, hold on because this is going to take about a couple of minutes. Okay. Basically, and remember, you know, of course, you know, I ran into a situation where 
now Brian, I consider to be one of my great friends, Brian Anderson, that we talked about. And Brian is a triple amputee. I worked on, um, that's actually a picture of one of his buddies, that's Kenny, the guy who's oh, in the turret, I believe. That's Kenny Olsen, I'm not sure. And the other guy on it was Mike Waite, who was also in the, in the Humvee. Anyway, um, so I, the Wizard Company has um, this thing uh, where they spin a wheel, and apparently you're supposed to come up and, and say, here's my category. So you may say as a fan, my category should be The Simpsons, and as the guest question asker I say well tell me what's the name of the storekeeper and then they say Apu and they get given a prize so I did this for a little while and I don't know anything about comics so of course they, they won a prize every time and I think Wizard were really getting upset with me because I was just giving away prizes and um, but one of them asked me about um, uh, German fighting ships of the Second World War and I know something about that I think he thought he was being clever but so I asked him a question about the Tirpitz and the only shipping you was the Bismarck so he answers it wrong and apparently at that point they're supposed to do a, um, a physical challenge so you give them five star jumps or something like that and then they get a chance to spin the wheel so I said to the guy well why don't you walk to the next booth on your hands and unfortunately the guy was missing one arm uh, so <laughs> it was this horrific moment where the oh. fan and everybody just went silent like oh no as if this could get any worse, this story actually did get worse. I then went to the Atlanta Dragon Con, and uh, I was telling Bill Sienkiewicz, who's a noted artist, about this horrible experience I'd had. And he said, you know, you need to, it's bad karma, man. You need to reconnect with the fans. Go over the other side of the table. Just wander around and find a fan and be nice to them. I said, okay, fine. So I wandered around, and Dragon Con's kind of crazy. And uh, I found a, a fan standing next to one of those, uh, like, Halloween booths where you get, like, vampire teeth and crazy Austin Powers teeth and googly eyes and uh, this lady was wearing Austin Powers teeth so I walked up to her and I said hey nice teeth and the problem was they were her teeth <laughs> and so I just <laughs> so I just screamed <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't even have I didn't even have the, the sense to do anything about it so you know and, uh, oh, so you just walked away from it Sean, you're right, it was strike two, and there actually is a strike three. I finally came back to Wizard World a couple of years ago. They brought the wheel back. I walked up, and I said, let me be the guest uh, s spinner again. They said, no, 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 do it. And I said, oh, come on, what could happen? There's, everybody's got their arms this year, right? And the guy literally spinning the wheel had one arm. <laughs> How does that happen? How does that happen? Because I'm Paul Jenkins, and this is what I do. <laughs> So I could see why uh, you might be cautious about talking to uh, your fans on the internet now that they totally have access to you. Yeah, no, it, it actually happened. And so, I, I, like I said, I've, I've written uh, this series, uh, these uh, articles. They're not up right now, but they're about to go back up again. And I'll post uh, somewhere on my Facebook or something or Twitter. Um, it's called Flogging a Dead Horse. And it was like really stupid things that have happened to me. And one of them was all about that story of uh, how basically my karma is just, just done, you know. My audio is a little bit hot. My audio is hot. What can I do about that? Uh, the sensitivity on your uh, on your video square. Okay, how does a, that sound? Is that a, a little bit better? There's a slider that you can turn down a little bit. I can pick up the guitar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, here we go. All right, yeah. What Do you see any questions coming up there? Who's the cookiest uh, person in comics other than Stan Lee? Todd the cookie, the, oh, the cockiest person in comics other than Stan Lee. Todd McFarlane. Well done. Good call. Uh, it's, difficult, it's difficult to, yeah, I don't know, it's difficult for me to say that. I, 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 I don't have much to say about my fellow professionals. That would be negative because they do the same job that I do, so I tend to kind of shy away from I get asked that kind of thing all the time, but I don't, I don't really want to kind of join in, you know. John's got um, a good question there. Do you communicate verbally with the artist uh, most on the page um, because he's never worked uh, in the comic industry? Yeah, um... I, I actually call almost every artist I work with, I'm really into that, because I think that the best thing you can do is to get some of the information from the artists about the things that they want to do. So I love that. I think it's great. I'll call the artists all the time and just say to them, look, you know, tell me what it is that you would like, and I'm happy to write that into the story as long as it fits into the story. If it does so, why not, right? It seems like a good idea, because think about it this way. It takes me 10, 15 minutes to write a page of a comic script. It takes an artist an entire day to draw it, so hopefully they're very, very engaged in what they do, and they're going to be much more engaged if they get a script that they like. 
and they'll have a script that they like if they feel like they're they take ownership on on a portion of that script you know Mr. Sean um, when, G is asking, uh, when you write and work with the artist, do you write in a screenplay style or more of a director style? Yeah, you know, know, storyboard numbers. That's actually a really good question. I, I have something right here that I can kind of hold up to camera because it's something I'm working on tonight. Um, here is a page of stuff, and you can see it's got, like, material written all over it, right? These are my notes, and right over here, you can actually see page numbers and it'll say like three pages, two pages. What I do is I turn that into panel breakdowns, which you can see right there. So I tend to be like very, very close, and I'll do all the panel breakdowns, I'll write sample dialogue. Um, in fact, let's see if I can just hold up one more, but you can see on the left-hand page there, um, there's some sample dialogue of stuff that I'm working on, right? So what I do is I then put that up on my side, and I start typing a script, and it's really like a movie script, uh, the way that I write it. So I tend to be... Um, I, you know, I tend to start with a blank piece of paper, I write the story, I break it down, I break it down into panels, because remember they're like frozen moments in time, and then once I've finished with that, um, I type it into a movie script. So all of my work is done before I really start typing the script, I think. Um, I have some other questions here, let me see uh, if I can catch up a little bit, hang on a second. Um, do I storyboard my script on scratch paper to see the flow, or do I write long hands? No, well, I, I hopefully answered some of that question. Um, Let's see. Do I have any advice on people who are just trying to break into the industry? Uh, my friend Mark Wade, uh, who's a noted comic book writer, has this great uh, piece of advice for people trying to break in. Uh, number one, don't <laughs> run the other way because it's scary. Number two, um, when people are trying to break into the... the um yeah, I'm shipping you a new webcam. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> I need one, right? Um, when people are trying to break into the industry... One of the things that they, Mark Wade believes that once DC find out or Marvel find out how you broke in, they close the avenue off forever. It's like a closed shop. How are you supposed to break into an industry that, that, that the industry itself does not want you to break into? And it almost feels like that, I'm pretty sure, for people. You know, there are plenty of talented people out there that really, really want to do it. I, I, can, I don't want to say the things that are very trite, like keep trying, believe in yourself. All, all I can say is what I did. Um, um, I broke in the way that, like I said, I don't believe that people can do it. I literally went to San Diego Comic Convention. I met the editor of Hellblazer, said I'd like to write Hellblazer, and wrote a script, and the guy read it, which was amazing, and then said, okay, you are the new writer of Hellblazer. I don't know how to say that to anybody else. I wish someone could break in that way, but it's not realistic to think you can. Having said that, I did, so why can't you? Surely, right? Sure. Um, hold on, I'm I'm finding some uh, I'm finding some more questions here. Let's see. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit behind here. Right. Do I ever get confused with temporary artist Paul Jenkins? Is he a pain in my interest? Yes, because he has PaulJenkins.com or something. I need that guy. We've written to that guy like 10 times saying, dude, is there any chance that you could let me have it because we're doing like loads of really good things? And that guy, that guy like never responds. I think he's just really pissed off with me at this point. <laughs> he's sick of the emails, I'm sure. Yeah, because I think he just gets kind of pissed off that people, like there's some guy that writes comics and this guy's like a fine artist, you know? <laughs> if you were to pick up any other URL, what would it be? Uh, I'm not sure. It's like, uh, I, can't, I can tell you what I want on my gravestone. Uh, yeah, I still my wife today. Well, because I've got this really quirky sense of humor, so I told my wife that when I die, uh, the first thing I want is I want this funeral where they put me on a funeral pyre and they put loads of dynamite beneath me, and then everybody retires to like two miles away with these high-powered telescopes, and then they, they they blow me up, so I just disappear <laughs> into pieces, and then and then my gravestone will have a little hand that waves like this, and it just waves at everybody, and then. Uh, and on it will say, here lies Paul Jenkins, he ate when hungry and he slept when he was sleeping. Right? Love it. Yeah, why That's not, epic. Right? I love it. <laughs> uh, dear. Okay, so uh, other questions. Sorry. I missed <coughs> how, did yeah, I feel, how did I feel Comic Con San Diego was this year? Uh, San Diego, for people who don't know, San Diego is like crazy. It's a wonderful experience and it is just amazing. But um, as a good my buddy Mike's writing that question because the fan energy was really different this year and everybody who normally goes to San Diego knows that this year was very different and we couldn't work out why for the longest time 
by way of explanation, Saturday at San Diego Convention is usually just an incredible time. It's, it's like crazy. You can't get through the convention. There's people just barging and screaming. Well, we went into the, the floor on, on Saturday this year, and there was nobody there. And we just couldn't believe it. What's happening here? What's happening is that San Diego Comic-Con is being appropriated by the movie industry. It's becoming, yeah, it was, it was sold out, but it's becoming like a movie festival. So it's, it was a great thing, but what we realized, why was it so quiet on the main comic book floor, that, or the floor that we were at, at least for the first part of Saturday? Because um, the Twilight panel was right down the other end of the building, and so many people had basically decided they were going to line up there for two days. I, I, by the way, I, I don't agree that the movie industry is killing the comics. I, I actually think it's a little bit different, to be quite honest. Um, in fact, I would imagine that the movie industry is actually helping the comic industry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the other way around. Um, it did not hurt us that Saturday felt quiet on the floor. It just was strange. It wasn't a bad thing. It was strange. We all looked at each other and said, how come this place isn't bustling like it normally is? Well, you know, once everybody had finished with the Twilight panel, they all came back into the show and it was sold out and it was like a crash again. It just so happened that the big movie events are beginning to happen, um, uh, you know, at Comic-Con. And so we're beginning to see a little bit of that spillage where we can't compete sometimes as comic guys with the movie industry. doesn't bother me because I'm getting into the movie industry anyway. So at that point, you know, they'll be here to see me do comics and films at home. Um, did I see the Suck Lord? Suckadelic.com. <laughs> no idea. Good. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think movies taking comic stuff because directors don't have ideas. Uh, pff, wow. I wish I could comment on it because if I could comment on it, I would say you're absolutely correct. Obviously, I'm not going to comment on Connor and because I, that would be unprofessional of me. But if I could comment on it, I would say you're absolutely right that Hollywood seems sometimes very devoid of. I just did. I did? Really? <laughs> but you didn't, so that's okay. No, I didn't comment on it. No, I no would this, never. this isn't a recorded chat. This won't live on the internet forever. <laughs> uh, writing a script for a video game versus a comic book. Differences, similarities. I will tell you this. Um, uh, by the way, to quickly address you, Patrick, earlier on, if I, you know, if asked would I have, what would I have done for a, was it what would I have done? Or, hang on a second, would I have written the Iron Man 2 movie? Of course I would. I love that kind of stuff. I'm not afraid of writing anything. Um, Chuck, the, the thing about writing a script for a video game, I've created this scale that we talk to people about, how hard it is to write a comic script, how hard it is to direct a movie, uh, you know, because I'm beginning to get a lot more experience now, and how hard it is to creatively direct a video game. Um, on that scale, writing a comic book is one. Directing a movie is probably 30 or 40. And... Creatively directing a video game is about 250. It is the most impossibly difficult job. It is just so hard, but you have to, um, in a sense, being a creative director of video games is, uh, you, you have to be able to see lots of things. Or I, I, I really believe this. When I came in to do this work, um, what I decided to do was to learn what all of the other people did. I wanted to work out what the programmers did, what the artists did. Um, I wanted to learn all about that kind of stuff. And so, because I really feel that that's the best way to uh, create anything is to learn everything about it as much as you can. So that's what I did. I, uh, and I think um, um, when you run into uh, work, uh, one of you out there, Sean, I guess, uh, you work in interactive, and it, you, you know how hard it is, right? It's like incredible incredibly, incredibly difficult to know all of the things that are going on in a game. It's really, really hard, much more difficult than directing a film. So when people kind of give you this impression that film directing is so incredibly difficult, never listen to a man. It's just, it's like all part of the Hollywood mystique. It's really crazy here in Hollywood. No one knows how to do it but us, well, of course, you know. Which one is the most fun? Um, the most fun? Film, I think, at the moment, because I've done so many comics for a long time. Um, uh, but I, I, comics are great because it's such a great way of telling stories. And frankly, uh, what's really fun about a video game is when you see the thing come to life after two or three years of work. That is pretty fun, you know. Um, I uh, have uh, had a chance to work on some pretty good ones. I did uh, Twisted Metal Black. I worked on that. I worked on Darkness, which uh, did very well. Um, yeah, can I talk about any upcoming video games? 
if I could talk about my upcoming video game projects. Oh no, wait, I can talk about one. Yes, uh, because it was announced by the it was announced by the people at Top Cow that in fact I've come on as the creative director for Darkness Two. Um, that was not me who said that, but Darkness Two is the sequel to the one that we got nominated for the. Uh, uh, for the BAFTA award, so obviously uh, we're excited to do that. And also, I've just worked on. Um, you know, people know that uh, that Mafia Two is coming out as well, and I've been working on a little bit of that stuff, um, which I really like. I think the game's uh, amazing. So we've got a couple of good uh, good games that I'm working on with Two K. Two K are really cool. Uh, they're a great company to work with. Um, the thing about them is that Two um, K make games that are really high quality. So they don't make a lot of games, but they make cool games. If any of you out there are interested in video games or not interested in video games, go play Bioshock and tell me if you don't like video games after that. Because Bioshock <laughs> was just Bioshock was just cool. It was an amazing game. And, With all these uh, different types of projects, you know, movies, video games, the books, um, are you flying all over the country all the time, or do you work from yeah, home? Is it, yeah. I mean, are you constantly on planes? Yeah. No, I am just. I, I go all over the place. Um, behind me, like. I have this, I wish I could take my camera around just to show a few things. Over in this direction, I have a recording studio over at the back, because I still do a lot of music. Um, it's a guitar sitting right here. Um, I have a video game development room right in the center with like video game development kits. Um, and um, uh, Can I come this camp room? out at your house for like a month? Is that cool? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like a fun place to be. There's certainly be a lot to do. Over back over this way, over in the distance up here, you can see my art table is over there. And then, you know, I just work at this computer and there's like loads of books and crazy stuff going on all over the place. Um, so, you know, I, I do have an interesting life. Uh, but I, I actually wrote in my Flog and a Dead Horse article one time that there's... Uh, there's a, an ancient Chinese curse that says, I think it's Chinese, that says, may you live in interesting times, right? And uh, my wife picked that out of a, um, a fortune cookie once. And she said, look, I got this date fortune. It says, you will, in, you will live in interesting times. And I said, no, no, for God's sake, we don't want that one. And three weeks later, our house was destroyed by a tornado. Oh. So, yeah, what can you do, right? <laughs> Stop eating those cookies. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's crazy, I, you know. Uh, I do live in interesting times, but uh, you know, what can I say? I, uh, let's see. What have we got here? Got a there was one that uh, earlier from Shampton Alive, Chicago located. Will you be attending C two E two Comic Chicago Comic and Enter Entertainment Expo next year? No, no. Um, I might do next year. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of. Uh, you know, I love to go around. I was actually asked to go to Toronto this weekend for another comic expo, and it's really, really tough. Um, here's a question that I really like, actually. Um, yeah, it's the Toronto Fan Expo that's going on right now. I just couldn't make it because I really have so many things to do. We have something in Atlanta called the Dragon Con, which is... Uh, <laughs> anyone that's ever been to the Dragon Con knows what it is. It's one of the craziest times in the world. It is... Yeah, Dragon Con rocks but smells. <laughs> it's, it's like loads and loads of crazy people. What's so great is that a lot of people are wearing next to nothing, but most of these people should not be wearing next to nothing. It's really terrifying. Um, it's like kind of one of those Ren fairs, you know. Um, I like this uh, question that says, what is my opinion of indie comics? Uh, because indie comics are really the lifeblood of our industry. And, uh, you know, people learn their storytelling chops in independent comics, uh, just like people learn how to make films by doing independent films and, and low, low budget films. So I actually have a few uh, series of my own that are coming out independently. I've got a book that's coming out um, in, um, in uh, France uh, through Soleil Publishing called Fablewood. Uh, it's called Fairy Quest with Umberto Ramos, uh, who I did a book called Revelations with. Revelations is a book, uh, this is kind of strange, and this is really where I come from, right? This book here, Revelations, is weird because it is a story of a murder mystery that's set in the Vatican and it doesn't fly in America. American audiences don't really want that kind of thing. Um, Why do you think but, that is? Well, because American audiences are conditioned to superheroes and they really want interesting stories that have, uh, you know, am I surrounded by conversation related prop? Yeah, well, I, yeah, 
uh, I've just got stuff all over my desk. <laughs> you know, I was kind of like, I got. Well, I did. I did pull this one out because I figured that people would want to see what Origin was. But yeah, I've got like conversation. I'm surrounded. Like, Brilliant. for instance, for instance, I'm really glad that they bought Yingling beer down to Georgia because this was only previously sold in Pittsburgh, and it's the only good American beer. I gotta say, the only one. Anyway, I think so. So I've never had it. I'll have to know. try it. Yingling, man, come on, it's great. It's the best. You know. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, you know, I was talking about independent comics and uh, what I find to be amazing about them is you can do any kind of story in independent comics and you can really kind of get away with it. I do some of those same stories, but I have to hide behind the spandex wearing kind of uh, superhero crowd. But I'm about to do one that I really like. Um, it got uh, announced the other day. I'm about to do a series of war stories um, called Band of Heroes, which is a little bit like Band of Brothers, right? And the way it was set up is that the original Timely comics from 70 years ago um, were the, the forerunners to Atlas and then to Marvel Comics. So the premise of my series is that the reason that those Timely comics went away is because they were basically propaganda magazines that dealt with some of the heroes. And at the time, a lot of the people that, that went to war never came back. And when they didn't come back, the, the magazines stopped being published. So it's kind of like this great tragic story that I get to write about what really happened to these people when they went to war. My next door neighbor is a really wonderful guy called Doug Huggins, and he happens to have been on the USS Arizona when it was bombed in Pearl Harbor, and his best friend was killed on, on – uh, he was on the St. Louis, sorry, and his best friend was killed on the Arizona. So I have such a, an affinity for war materials. Um, um, the question here, you know, if I would consider taking my comics to film. In fact, you know, we have three or four uh, deals that we've either signed or are signing right now for, uh, you know, we've got a TV option for one of them. Um, uh, so, you know, I have some really cool materials coming up. And I love the fact that I'm able to create in comics. It's one of the reasons why independent comics work for me. I have a couple of independent comics that are going to be coming in the next couple of years. Marvel has been amazing because I'm, I'm uh, exclusive to Marvel. But they don't want to stand in the way of my development. So, in fact, um, um, they've said that I can publish elsewhere. Uh, the, the rule is kind of to be exclusive to Marvel. Just don't really go and publish at DC. You know, they're, they're obviously major competitors, so they don't want that. Can people follow you on Twitter to hear any of the announcements that you might have about upcoming projects? Yeah, my, my thing, I think we put it up here. Um, I've got a Facebook page, which I think we've got a, a, a link to, and I've got Pod Yonkers is my Twitter name. Uh, Pod Yonkers came about because nobody could understand my accent when I first moved. So I, I remember <laughs> calling some place, and I said, uh, it's Paul Jenkins. And the secretary couldn't understand me, and I said it about eight times. And I was saying, look, it's like, it's like Pope John Paul. It's like Paul McCartney. You know who Paul McCartney is, right? Yeah, she says. So she transfers me through instead of... Paul Jenkins from Mirage Studios. She transfers me through as Pod Yonkers from Garage Videos. <laughs> <laughs> so my Pod Yonkers name has stuck ever since. You know. Um, good question again. Uh, I, I, I honestly, any indie comics we should be reading right now. The the only thing that I'll say uh, is that I have a series called Sidekick, um, and Sidekick is really stupid. It's basically Benny Hill with superheroes. Um, but it's something that you guys should be following. Uh, I think you have some sidekick materials up there. Yeah, it's up there. Uh, sidekick is basically the story of this superhero sidekick, and he can't make any money as a superhero sidekick. So he makes a really bad decision to be a sidekick to four heroes at the same time, and his life is just screwed at that point. <laughs> um, so uh, that's one that I think you guys should keep an eye on because you know we were asking about what materials we are working forward with in t film and television and that's actually one that we've developed out um, okay that's the last one I've, I've got to end on we've got a drunk spider-man yeah. here on the floor with two <laughs> two cans of Guinness is this you in a yeah. spider-man suit no I, I was uh, yeah he came to my house at Wizard what? magazine Wizard magazine did an article about me, and it was a day in the life of Paul Jenkins. They wanted to follow me around, and they couldn't keep up because I, I happened to have soccer practice that day, and I was, you know, I was hanging out playing pool, played golf. So they got an actor in a Spider-Man suit to come down and caddy for me at the golf course, which is really funny because you'd hear these carts go by and then reverse because they couldn't, they couldn't work out what was happening. Right? It was like Spider-Man's caddying for that guy. 
So in the end, uh, we took some incriminating photographs of Spider-Man drunk off his ass, <laughs> laying on the ground, just like with covered with cans of Guinness. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I, I, I was watching one, uh, a video uh, of a presentation you gave earlier today, um, and you, I, I think you were in a, some sort of parking lot, and a guy, was it a Spider-Man costume? No, 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 it was, a, it was a different superhero, walked up to you, and you were talking about having conversation with random people in superhero yeah. costumes. Yeah, no, it, yeah, it, it happens to me all the time. It's one of the funniest things when you're doing a signing and someone comes up dressed as a character that you created. And they know more about the character than you do. That scares me. <laughs> but it also is exhilarating, you know, because it's very gratifying to create something that affects somebody. You know? Well, Paul, you know, I hate to wrap this up, but I think we're at the end of the night here. Um, this has been a really cool conversation. And, you know, I, I, could, I could go on all night just listening to your stories. And it's really been amazing. So um, thank you to Paul Jenkins. Please follow him on Twitter. He's Pod Yonkers. Um, and we can't wait to hear more... Uh, more news like, about all the cool things that you're working. Is there anything specific that you want to pimp right now? Uh, I don't know. I, everything, man. I, you know, I'm just lucky and just keep on come by my Facebook page. You'll see what I do. Uh, follow Flogging a Dead Horse, which ought to be coming to you at a comic book website that I can't name sometime soon. So Flogging a Dead Horse is the article I write. I love doing that thing. And uh, thanks to everybody for coming out and I'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you, everybody. This has been Design Chat, the best design discussion on the Internet. Uh, we do this every week, so come back. Uh, follow me on, on uh, Twitter. I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. Uh, thank you to Mashable for having us, and also thank you to Samana Mason. So uh, good night for tonight, and we'll see you soon.